good afternoon and welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us for to, uh, thank you all so much for joining us for today's uh, lunch and learn program with Dr. Scott French. Um, I will let him introduce the program, but um, I just wanted to introduce everybody to the History Center here. For those of you who maybe this is your first time or you're attending virtually and you have not been to the History Center yet, we are a history museum located in downtown Orlando. We cover 14,000 years of Central Florida history. Um, so going back all the way uh, back past the pre-Columbian Native Americans up through today. Um, we are happy to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Scott French. He's an associate professor of history at UCF, as well as director of public history program and the uh, direct, associate director for the Center for, of the Center for Humanities and Digital Research. He received his PhD in history from the University of Virginia in 2000. Uh, he is additionally the author of The Rebellious Slave, Nat Turner in American Memory, and lead author with Craig Barton and Peter Flora of Booker T. Washington Elementary School and Segregated Education in Virginia. So uh, thank you, Dr. French. I'll let him take over from here. Thank you, Katie, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming out today to uh, the Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm going to talk about Eatonville, and Eatonville has been in the news lately. I, I know some of you are following that and, and may be here because of that. Um, a lot of times when people tell the story of Eatonville, Florida, they, they focus on its uh, birth date, which is 1887. It's the one of the oldest, earliest historical uh, incorporated black municipalities in the United States. There's one other claim to first, and that's uh, Princeville, North Carolina, and I think they've won that debate. Uh, but Eatonville is still alive and thriving, um, but endangered. And so the story I'm going to tell today is really a little bit before 1887. I want to talk about the origins of Eatonville before it was even called Eatonville. Um, and then I want to sort of take us up to the present, history in the now, and sort of the, the question of Eatonville's future in the face of uh, development pressures. And um, so let's get started. Okay, I include this slide just to say I've been researching Eatonville and Maitland and this uh, era of town building for several years and have uh, created a number of exhibits and published a number of articles, some in Winter Park Magazine, another in Change Over Time, which is a scholarly uh, journal. Um, and so I, I've really become immersed in the subject. And what I'm going to share to you, with you today are some of the findings of that research. Um, I also, by the way, besides that, I, I've in the recent years uh, been working with a, an Eatonville uh, native, John Beecham, and doing historical walking tours. And I have to say that has given me a, real, a new appreciation for public history on the streets, taking history to the streets, and also actually really understanding the landscape and the connection between uh, Maitland and Eatonville. And I'm going to talk about that historical connection today. There's some pictures of us on our walking tour. We do this on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday and at other occasions. And if you're interested, we can arrange one for you. Um, so I'd like to start uh, my talks about Eatonville with emancipation, with Juneteenth. Juneteenth is now a national holiday and um, celebrating um, really the moment when uh, the word of emancipation really reached Texas. Um, but it's also symbolic, right? It's, it's, it's a moment to look back and celebrate this joyous occasion of the end of slavery, but it's also looking forward, what next? What comes next? Uh, what does freedom mean? How do you bring, uh, a me uh, how can you define the meaning of freedom uh, in this moment? And so um, it is a, it's, a, it's, it's a revolution, really. It's a moment in which uh, black citizenship is being uh, written into the Constitution, equal protection under the law, voting rights, the three great Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th. That's the backdrop for the story we're going to tell. Uh, the people who were the founders of Eatonville were um, coming out of the period of slavery. Um, and of course, they're also dealing with the backlash, uh, the, the, the passage of black codes, um, segregation and disfranchisement coming in, um, in, in, uh, in a kind of scattered way at first, but then in a very uh, sort of like a movement at the end of the, the century, um, and mob violence and lynching. So there's factors that are playing into people's decisions about 
how to create a life, right? Where to create a new life. And one of the, one of the ways to define freedom is through mobility, through movement, right? It's, it's probably the most fundamental uh, uh, definition of freedom is the freedom to, to, to move. And that's the story we're going to talk about today. Um, there's a sort of bigger movement, which uh, some of you may have heard about in the 1870s and 1880s. There was a movement west. Uh, it was called the Exoduster Movement. And um, Ho for Kansas. And Nicodemus, Kansas is one of the settlements that emerged from that. And if you go to the uh, Smithsonian Museum, you'll see displays devoted to these uh, settlements that emerged in typically in the West. We don't often think of these settlements being in the South. You think of people leaving the South, right? We're going to tell a story about people who are actually coming South from farther North. Um, people like Joseph Clark, who was born in, into slavery uh, in Georgia and migrated South uh, to Florida, to this part of Florida, um, to look for homesteads and steady work and, and, and work that was becoming available in the citrus groves, in the railroads, and in these emerging uh, resort towns and communities in this area. So this was a destination. A lot of people were coming into this area. It really is the frontier. This, is, this area, central Florida, had not been settled. And so there's an opportunity to build towns free of plantation culture, right, that, that plantation structure. Everything is new. Everything is possible in this moment. Um, and so the railroads are helping to fuel this. They're, they're coming down from Jacksonville and Sanford, and um, that's, creating, uh, that's, that's creating conditions for rapid settlement. And uh, real estate developers are, are building these uh, beautiful new homes uh, for winter residences, for northern snowbirds. Um, and what they see here is that they can build a house and pay for it with citrus groves, right? So that's a nice economic model. Come down here in the winter, um, enjoy the weather here, uh, avoid, avoid those northern snowstorms, and then leave, but leave the groves in the hands of caretakers and, of course, workers, particularly African-American workers who are living here year-round. Um, this is a year-round uh, economic model, right? Um, and so um, for African-Americans, it's work on the railroads, in the citrus groves, and in these areas. And I actually did a little chart. I have to use, it's a little small for even my eyes here. But um, in 1885, the Florida census uh, shows 322 black or mulatto residents of Maitland Winter Park. And three out of four were born in Florida or Georgia. And all of them came from southern states. So that's one of the groups moving into this area, people coming from other parts of Florida and from other southern states for African Americans. Um, and um, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, one of the most famous uh, uh, of, of Eatonville's um, famed uh, native daughters, I guess you'd call her. She wasn't born there, but she moved there as a child and claimed it as her birthplace. Um, she writes about the founding of Maitland and the, the, the arrival of African Americans into this area. She writes in her autobiography, now, the Negro population of Maitland settled simultaneously with the white. They had been needed and found profitable employment. While the white estates flourished on the three-mile length of Lake Maitland, the Negroes set up their hastily built shacks around St. John's Hole, a lake as round as a dollar and less than half a mile wide. It is now a beauty spot in the heart of Maitland, hard by U.S. Highway number 17. They call it Lake Lily. So Lake Lily, for those of you who are from this area, really is the first uh, African-American settlement in this area. And we know that from Zora. It's where I walk my dog every morning, too. I live right around there. Um, so continuing with Zora, the Negro women could be, she writes, the Negro women could be seen every day but Sunday, squatting around St. John's Hole on their haunches, primitive style, washing clothes and fishing, while their men went forth and made their support in cutting new ground, building and planting orange groves. Things were moving so swiftly that there was plenty to do with good pay. Okay. So why were African-American workers who are making good pay living in shanties around Lake Lily and not in homes of their own? Economically, they seem to be doing pretty well. Well, we, we know why from jo, Joseph Clark, who, was one of the, who would become one of the founders of Lake Lily, and he tells us that... Um, 
during the years of 1875 to 1877 that he and two other colored men uh, had tried, attempted to purchase land for the purpose of establishing a colony for colored people, but so great was the prejudice then existing against the Negro that no one would sell them land for the purpose. So they're closed out. Um, and he says a colony. That, that's an interesting term. And in fact, uh, what does that mean? Um, some people have referred to these as race colonies. I prefer the term freedom colony. And here I'm citing the work of Andrea Roberts. Um, she's a historian and urban planner who studies freedom colonies in Texas. And she defines freedom colonies as intentional communities created largely in response to political and economic repression by white mainstream society. Joe Clark tells us that they came here to build a to create a colony, but could not because they couldn't buy the land to do so. So what's causing that, um, why is it so difficult for them to buy the land? Um, partly it's this rising commercial value of the Florida citrus grove land, uh, and that's gonna complicate things. Um, this area, Maitland uh, in particular, Lake Maitland it was called, was first settled in 1871 by homesteaders but by 1875 and 77, it was already gentrifying. Um, wealthy white investors were buying out those pioneer settlers. And so it was getting increasingly expensive and difficult to buy land. And so there's economic reasons why. Um, and in fact, this is validated. This is an article I found uh, in 1902 talking about the history of Eatonville that really makes the same point. The disinclination by these Maitland Grove owners to sell land to Joseph Clark and his fellow colonists uh, was due partly to the feeling that the colored man would become too independent if he had property of his own, and partly to the fact that every inch of the land was used by the white folks for orange culture. So there's two things going on. There is racial prejudice, and there's also this sort of uh, hoarding, land hoarding, right? Um, and you can understand that they, they were dependent on the black labor force to work, the, the white people were dependent on African Americans to work their groves. What would happen if the African Americans bought land and simply raised their own and sold their own citrus. They were, they were interested in keeping African Americans as a labor force. So how did Clark and his fellow freedom colonists, who were denied in their efforts to purchase land and, and forced to live in these shanties and outbuildings, how did they acquire the land to create this self-governed colony for colored people that they envisioned? Here again, Joseph Clark tells us. Uh, he credits Lewis Lawrence, a wealthy white northern capitalist, uh, and philanthropists who made the purchase possible. Clark writes, in 1883, Mr. and it's actually earlier than 1883, but Mr. Lewis Lawrence, who came to Maitland in 1875 from Utica, New York, a whole-souled philanthropist, came to the rescue by purchasing the land on which is now located the city of Eatonville. Named after Eaton, Josiah Eaton from Maine sold the land to Lawrence, and Lawrence then subdivided it and sold it to African Americans. Eaton, Clark, and, and uh, Lawrence, in, in essence, worked together to make this happen. Um, it's named for Eatonville, Eatonville because Lawrence wanted it named for Eaton. He asked that it be named for Eaton. And Mr. Lawrence at once built them a church and several cottages, giving them a chance to pay for the same on easy payments. So it wasn't a gift. It was affordable housing. So who's Lewis Lawrence? That was my big question, and that's what got me into my research. I wanted to know what motivated him and uh, what were his political, his ideological, his economic motives for opposing the exclusion of black from land ownership, unlike his other white neighbors, and why did he support efforts to create a colony for the colored people of Maitland? Um, and my research took me to Utica, New York. I went up, I met descendants of his, I worked in the Utica library and the archives up there, and Lawrence is a fascinating guy. He was born in upstate New York in 1806. He was orphaned at an early age, uh, apprenticed to a carpenter. He moves uh, to um, uh, the, uh, the area of the Erie Canal area era, which is really starting to boom, and makes a fortune in the lumber business in Utica. Um, he was very active in the moral movements of the day. He was active in the New York Anti-Slavery Society, said to be active in the Underground Railroad, said to have been arrested for helping an enslaved person to freedom. Um, he, uh, he actually had, had experimented in creating a model town there 
in upstate New York during the Civil War. It was a lumber and railroad town, but it was similar in some ways to what he did later in Eatonville. It was um, an attempt to sort of uh, provide decent housing for his workers and um, to ensure that they followed sort of the moral strictures that he, temperance and other things. So um, he was very active in the Republican Party, the par party of Lincoln, the party of, Recon of Reconstruction, and would have been aligned with the radical Reconstruction wing of the party. He supported Senator Roscoe Conkling, who was the author of the 1875 Civil Rights Act, which much of which was gutted by the Supreme Court, but was very far advanced for its time. And Lawrence actually started a newspaper in support of Conkling, and that's how I know so much about his beliefs, because there's two years of it not digitized in the Utica Library, and I read every issue. And, and it's fascinating to see his, when he talks about the South and the fate of African Americans. He was afraid that, and he, 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 he chastised his own party for abandoning African Americans in the South in 1877. He said, it's just going to go back into the hands of the planters. Can't do that. It's, it's wrong. Um, and I, want, I use the term moral capitalist to talk about Lawrence because he really fits into this type. Um, and this is historians use this term to describe the fusing of 19th century entrepreneurial capitalism with middle class family values and Christian piety. Um, they view charity as, a, as kind of an investment. Um, if it's managed wisely, it pays dividends uh, for the recipient, the donor, and society alike. And, um, a lot of Lawrence's friends, when he died, commented on his, uh, um, his skill that he was able to harmonize his Christian beliefs with his economic interests as an employer. Um, a lot of rich people worried about getting into heaven, right? And so he, this is part of what's driving him, right? Um, he was indeed an encouraging instance, this is a quote from a friend, in which a capitalist can exhibit a Christian character in his dealings with laboring men. He solved to his own satisfaction and theirs the difficult question of how friendly relations can be maintained between master and men. So it's, this is a class relationship, and he fe feels you can, you can, if you, you know, work with a moral guidance, you can sort of, uh, you know, smooth those relations, which were producing all kinds of conflict in urban areas, but he felt he had come up with a way of getting around that. And he wanted to go, he, he visits the South, and um, he thinks it could be northernized. He thinks it could be one of the most northernized of the southern uh, reconstructed states. He envisioned, uh, the, if it was guided by people like him, of course, um, he envisioned the rise of a modern, harmonious, class-stratified society that would be built on the economic and political alliance of wealthy white northern capitalists and the African-American workers that they employed. Um, they could become a political uh, force, right? Um, and together, these Republican Party loyalists would establish a biracial political alliance that was rooted in citizenship, voting rights, and property ownership. That's uh, quite a vision. And he thought it could be done here in Florida because this land had not been, this, the towns had not yet been built. You could create this. Um, and, and already, demographically, you see that's what we're, we're getting African Americans, northern whites and native white southerners all coming here and they're about equally divided in this area well, one third each but if you put the northern white uh, snowbirds and African Americans together they have a majority and that's going to happen in these small towns they are going to rule those towns at first places like Winter Park and Maitland are really controlled by that kind of alliance briefly so I mentioned that Lawrence comes south he visits Maitland he says this is like Eden. It's so beautiful. Um, uh, one of the most lovely spots to be found. Uh, I could see those little beautiful lakes surrounded with all kinds of tropical fruits, and he just goes on and on. It just loves the area. Um, as long as you could keep this land pure from all that is hateful to God and man, Lord would, the Lord would take care of the rest. Um, so... He buys a parcel. 1875, he buys an 80-acre parcel for a model grove, and this is where Copper Rocket is, sort of on Lake Ave. If you go down, it's, it's in that, it, that's where his grove was. Um, and uh, he lived right near Josiah Eaton, who was on Lake Catherine. And, and Eaton remembered Lawrence as a bright, cheery old man, then in his mid-70s, getting right in among the colored hands and in his shirt sleeves with his pantaloons rolled up and with a great broad-brimmed straw hat sheltering him from the sun. So he would get down and work. He was always a man of the people. I told you he was born and he was orphaned at a young age and really always supported working people, although he was quite wealthy. He was a millionaire, which meant something back then. Uh, um, 
So he, I mentioned this. He conceived a great liking. He liked the climate. Uh, he believed it would ultimately become the most northernized of southern states and that with the aid of northern capital and enterprise, it would develop rich resources and yield rich returns. That's his vision. There's an economic model here. Um, but something bothered him about this area. Um, he, he, it troubled, he noted that African Americans were being excluded from land ownership, and he, it troubled him to see his own grove workers, some of them less than two decades removed from slavery, living in outhouses and hovels without decent homes or a church of their own. And this is a quote from uh, uh, his biographer, his friend and mentor. Uh, he had, Lawrence had noticed the averseness of most white people, northern as much as southern, to allowing the colored hands to acquire land in anything like proximity of the white settlements. As he, Lawrence, expressed it, most people wanted their hands to rise up out of the earth in the morning, and when their day's work was done, would have them vanish like ghosts into thin air. Which I think is a very powerful quote. <laughs> Um, and it bothered him, and so he decided to do something about it. And I mentioned that he was able to acquire land from Eaton. Eaton was willing to sell it to him, and Lawrence platted a village for the colored people near his grove. He made 48 small lots and home sites available for, for, available for purchase on easy terms. He erected a frame church for the village, and, and uh, it was the first church of, for, in the area, and it's still there in uh, it's, Saint, it's the historic Thomas House, if you ever go into Eatonville. Um, it's across the street from St. Lawrence Church now. It was rolled across the street at some point, but um, that is believed to be the original uh, St. La Lawrence Church, named for Lawrence, Louis Lawrence, St. Lawrence. So the, the deeds. The deeds include a restriction on resale to colored people only. They also have moral restrictions, just as Lawrence did in his model town in, in upstate New York. No liquor, no gambling. And so let's talk about the colored only restriction. Normally when we see that, we think of uh, segregation as, uh, you know, this being a kind of uh, stigma, right? That this is designed to uh, keep African Americans apart. But remember, they're fully excluded. And so these deeds are actually, in my uh, view, protective, to protect the owners of these lots from predatory white uh, forces, right? It's people who would come in, they could get into debt. That's part of the reason not to get into debt. You could lose the land to uh, someone you owe money to. But these, these uh, racial covenants would prevent the land from passing into the hands of whites. It would remain a black uh, town or, at this point, a subdivision. It was, it was protective. Um, and um, they were inclusive by design. It would ensure that African Americans would have a place within this community moving forward, that, that, that other forces, gentrification, whatever, would not erode their claim to this piece of land. Does that make sense? That's my thesis. That's my thesis, that it's protected. Knowing Lawrence's background and understanding the forces at work, that these are not designed in any way to stigmatize, and they're not designed to uh, to, to inform to create a segregated society, but more to protect the land and ensure it stays within the black community. Um, and in fact, uh, 1886, this is a year before Eatonville becomes an independent township, Josiah Eaton described it. He says, at present, the village has two churches, a Masonic hall, a store, and a school of some 30 bright children whose willingness and eagerness to learn cannot be excelled. Its straight, clean streets lined with shade trees, its little fruit yards beautiful with flowers, are in most striking contrast to the low, squalid, unhealthy, and disorderly colored quarters that pertain to most southern towns. That's important because it, this is, a, in a sense, a model. What can happen when African Americans have an opportunity to buy land and own property and have pride in ownership, this is what you will find. And, and it's, a, it's a message to other whites who are excluding black people because they associate black life with the lowest uh, conditions, right? The, the, these colored, the bottom lands. And, uh, and they're trying to say, no, you can create, there is, with freedom, with, with opportunity, you will see the development of a middle class. But it has to be nurtured and made possible. Now, um, sorry about that. Um, importantly, the town of Lake Maitland incorporated before the town of Eatonville. And among the incorporators were one third African Americans from the subdivision. So the, fa the, the people living in what would become Eatonville 
before they created the town of Eatonville, helped to create the town of Lake Maitland. They were among the incorporators. Um, and, they, and according to Zora Neale Hurston, uh, and th we, know, and we know for sure that at least one African-American served on the board of aldermen in Maitland. Zora tells us actually that um, several officials were elected, African-American officials were elected, but she makes this, she stresses that it, was, it worked well. There were no conflicts. Um, she said that this was experiment in biracial democracy worked. Um, never for a moment, she says, did the people of Maitland consider excluding the Negroes from participation. These are the northern-born snowbird Republicans. They never thought about excluding them. But, of course, if relations were so good, why did the African-American residents of Maitland's Eaton Eatonville subdivision decide to separate from Maitland and form their own independent township? And I think the answer there is what Joe Clark told us, is that they had always had the intention of creating a colony for the colored people, a, 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 a and, and, and political autonomy, self-governance, was key to that. They would live under their own vine and fig tree. That They wanted to prove that they could govern themselves. This was one of the racial carnards of the day, that black people can't govern themselves. And they were going to disprove that. And, and so it was important to them. Um, it did mean that Maitland lost... Uh, in a sense, lost their political, they lost their political voice within Maitland, and Maitland became predominantly white and, and uh, not exclusively white, but it came to be thought that way. And, and of course, there were people in Maitland that were not unhappy about the fact that African Americans left and politically were no longer a threat. Not everybody, remember, they wouldn't sell land. Many wouldn't sell land to African Americans. So I think Zora paints a pretty rosy picture there. I think there were push and pull factors at work there. Um, but it was convenient for both. And if you read newspaper accounts of the day, they describe it that way, that the white people of Maitland were perfectly fine with this. They did not object to it. It was a good solution. And it probably helped clear the shanties around Lake Lily, which within a decade or so in the newspapers tell us was beautified. So I think that that was also going on here, that the, that shanty village around Lake Lily would also disappear. Um, so in August of 1887, uh, Eatonville incorporated as one of the first state-chartered African-American munici municipalities in the United States. 27 African-American men, including many of Maitland's founders, signed the town charter. Columbus Bozier was elected mayor, and Joseph Clark served as an alderman. So this is the, the moment when normally we join the story. We just say, oh, it, it, but you see, uh, there was a decade before that, or not quite a decade, um, 81 to 87, so six years for six years, this community, uh, which became Eatonville, had already begun to flourish. It was born fully formed as a town. Um, and they announced their high purpose, the Eatonville's founders, in an open letter to the colored people of the United States because they want to recruit people to come move here, to live here. Come join us. Come help solve the great race problem uh, by securing a home in Eatonville, Florida, a Negro city governed by Negroes. And so um, they're reporting now, this newspaper is the only surviving issue of the Mill Speaker at Maitland Art and History Museum, which was hanging in a frame, and I got it digitized. I said, this is too valuable. We have to get that. Um, Six years have passed, and today Eatonville is an incorporated city of between two and 300, populated with a, a mayor, uh, with board of aldermen, and all the necessary adjuncts of a full-fledged city, not a white family in the whole city. And this was advertised to the world. Um, and in fact, they, they marketed it much the way, say, Winter Park marketed itself, right? They would send out, it's saying it's a beautiful place. The piney woods surrounded by beautiful lakes, stocked with fish, Woods full with deer, turkey, quail. Um, every intelligent Negro seeking a solution to the race problem should come here. Um, why would that matter that it has all this? Now you could survive here. You'd have your own land to grow food on, but you could also hunt and fish. And that's part of this is that economically, even in hard times, with your own property, your own garden, your own land, and all this wonderful natural life around you, you could survive. Um, this is important. I include this that uh, this is the pitch. Five and ten acre lots can be bought for five and ten dollars per acre according to location. Lots to actual settlers. No speculators. You have to come here and live here. This is a colony, a community that is about, is very much a community. Um, you know, you have to commit. 
And in fact, one of those who bought lots in Clark's edition was Reverend John Hurston, Zora's father. He, he bought lots four and five in block 10 from Joseph and Martha Clark in 1880, 1899, and then the remaining six lots in block 10 in 1905, about a year after Zora's mother died, um, and then and, and when Zora was also on her way out of town. But um, I think that's just a great point here, is that many people took up this offer, come live here. Um, newspaper, the story went viral. Um, not only was there the Eatonville Speaker article, probably reprinted, but uh, stories talking about this new settlement all over the United States and, and interviewing Joe Clark and saying, well, how do your people live? And he would say, um, well, we can work in the resorts and the homes. Of the, and he would say, uh, when times were tough, we can garden. So I, he was making that pitch that this is a, a, a really a, a perfect set, setting for a, 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 historic, a black township that can survive because economically all around it, there was demand for black labor and they could always come to Eatonville uh, to get workers. So it's a labor source for all the neighboring white communities, but it's also independent, self-sufficient. And this is an article, full-page article in the Louisville Courier Journal filled with photographs, a model Negro town in Florida. Um, and, and one of the things I want to talk about here is it says it, it it's, you know, uh, has uh, varied industries, scores of varied industries, so it had thriving businesses and uh, truck gardening and lots of things going on, but also a fine industrial school. And so here I'm going to very quickly transition to talk about that industrial school. Um, and by the way, it's the model Negro town of the South. So just to show you an example of the, this, let's talk about that industrial school because it's in the news, the Hungerford School, Robert Hungerford School. This was one of 23 industrial schools uh, founded by graduates and former students of Booker T. Washington's famed Tuskegee Institute. And the Hungerford campus was really a mini Tuskegee, um, part of what we would now call the Tuskegee universe. Um, and a um, little background, uh, before it was founded, uh, there had been efforts to attract uh, Edward Waters College from Jacksonville here in 1895. This is you know, four years before Hungerford was created. Uh, the Hungerford School, E.C. Hungerford, who was a winter resident of Maitland from Chester, Connecticut, offered to donate 20 acres of land uh, to uh, raise funds to create, to bring Edward Waters College to Eatonville. And that deal fell through. And um, so two graduates of Tuskegee, Russell and Mary Calhoun, were teaching a public school in Eatonville, and they said to Mr. Hungerford, would you give us those 20 acres? He said, I'll give you 40 acres if you, if you build a school. And so they say, we, we decided to cast our loss here. We, we, we believe that we could create this sort of Tuskegee-inspired uh, educational campus here in Eatonville. We were committed to it. So... Um, uh, just to understand that the industrial model, um, the, the idea is that the, these schools are training African Americans for gainful employment in a rapidly industrializing South. Um, sometimes they would focus on, well, I'll show you sort of the curriculum, but this is, this is acceptable in the eyes of uh, many skeptical whites because it's not, um, it, it isn't a threat to the white power structure. It's, it's, it's to train them for work as really in a kind of economy where they would, they would never uh, threaten uh, the, the status of whites. And um, uh, it, it was downplayed. The degree to which they were teaching literary arts or preparing students for college was very much downplayed. But if you read what was going on in these schools, they were teaching literary arts. They were teaching English and other uh, sort of general topics. Um, these are the kind of things that you would learn in uh, domestic work, industrial arts, and agriculture by gender. And you can see for girls, dressmaking, sewing, cooking, laundering, housekeeping, and for boys, blacksmithing, wheelwriting, carpentry, agriculture, etc. But we give no industry at the expense of literary work. The academic department covers a useful course of the English branches. And in fact, Zora Neale Hurston was a student at Hungerford and has a wonderful description of life in, at Hungerford under the direction of the Calhouns. She even describes the Calhouns, and there's this great incident in there where she would say white people would, they would always, white people were always coming in to, to look at the school because they were potential donors. It's a private school, it lives on donations, 
and meager tuition. So white people are always coming by, and she has this great scene in there where the two white women come in, and she's, the students are asked to read, and she starts reading, and everybody is just like, oh, my God. You know? um, she thought she was in trouble or something. You have to read it yourself. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful excerpt. Um, but she's talking about Mrs. Calhoun in the back of the room with a switch, ready to you know, punish anyone who got out of hand. It's really great. Um, the Hungerford mattered. It, it, it drew uh, people from, it, it held an annual farmers conference. Mrs. Booker T. Washington came there, and Booker T. Washington came in 1912. Um, and and have, you can read, you can really learn a lot, which my students and I are doing, about the everyday activity on this growing campus. It started at 40 acres, it grew to a 304. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but always looking for support. Here are some beautiful images. This is Booker T. Washington Hall, the dormitory, another picture. Principal Calhoun and the first quartet, they raised a lot of money with the singers. They would go out and perform in the hotels in this area. Sewing room, blacksmith and wagon shop, and teaching. They had a connection to the community. Um, and this is important, that Eatonville was always very tightly connected to Hungerford. And, um, Hungerford always opened its doors and was trying to educate the farmers uh, in that area as well. Like the people who were not students at the school were also in effect, they sometimes called it the People's University. In fact, in one article, they describe Hungerford as the People's University because it opened its doors to uh, the rank and file uh, you know, uh, people, the, the parents of some of the local students that attended. And by the way, Hungerford always opened its doors to public school students because there were no public schools for black students. Um, there were very few, at least at the high school level. There were elementary schools, but not high school. And Hungerford filled that need up until the 1950s. There was, it really, the county was not providing those things, and Hungerford served that purpose. Um, it got a lot of coverage itself in the press. And, it, it, and by the way, it was when it got annexed in, in uh, these are more pictures, when, when it got annexed, this is Booker T. Washington visiting Thousands of people attended. Um, but in 1919, Eatonville annexed the Hungerford property. And um, that was basically tripled the, whole, the, the land size of Eatonville. Eatonville's historic core was 112 acres. It added 304 acres. So Hungerford really dwarfed Eatonville in terms of the land. A lot of that land has been sold off. We're only now talking about 100 acres that are left. Um, this is Hungerford in 1941-49, and this is right before the county took control of the property. Um, so this is the moment that you've probably been reading about in the press. Um, the county, let's see if I can <laughs> say this in a concise way. So Hungerford School had been a private school with boards of trustees um, and had had its ups and downs. It went into periods of decline, particularly in the Depression era, um, but it seemed to be coming back out in the 40s. Its day student population was rising, but its boarding student population was decreasing. Um, the day students, a lot of them were coming from Winter Park. Winter Park made a deal with Hungerford in 1936 to send its, its African-American students to Hungerford. They didn't pay tuition for that, but they did provide a teacher and some in-kind support. But really, Hungerford was taking on the responsibility of the state to educate Winter Park students. And so the day, number of day students went up because those students were coming in to, to take their high school courses there. Um, but behind the scenes, there was a lot of concern that this model was going to fail because those day students were going to start disappearing. A lot of pressure was being put on counties to equalize their black and white facilities. They were being threatened with loss, lawsuits, equalization lawsuits. Orlando had one, Miami had one, and in response, they were, they were really hustling, knowing that the courts were going to come down on them if they couldn't equalize. Separate but equal demands something that approaches equal. In many cases, there was nothing. So these counties, for years, had been relying on students going somewhere else, going to Hungerford. Suddenly, they're under legal pressure to provide schooling, and they're building schools. And the more schools that get built, the fewer students are coming to Hungerford from Miami and other places. They're going to go, stay home. Um, and so there was real concern that they were, that among some of the trustees, uh, these are, at this point, they are appoint, trustees appointed by the courts. 
That's too complicated to get into, but they're all white. So when people say the Hunger for Trustees voted to transfer the land to Orange County, they were all white. They were not local, really, and they, they were representing the interests of the state. So Orange County needs to find a place to put, it's put to, needs a public school to avoid being sued. They see the hunger for property and say, that looks great. That's perfect. Um, how about if you sell that to us? And they negotiate a sale for $16,000 for 300 plus acres. Um, and there was, but not everybody liked that idea. And there, were, there was a group called the Friends of the Hungerford School, led by Hamilton Holt and Edwin Grover from Rollins College, Mary McLeod Bethune. They all tried to save the Hungerford School as a private property. They wanted to keep it private, and they thought that they could come up with a way to make that viable. The all-white state-appointed trustees said, no, we're going to go ahead with the transfer to Orange County. And that's really at the crux of a lot of what's going on right now because Orange County is um, trying to sell that property, what's left of it. Let's see if we can get up here to the present. Okay, so this is the kind of development that has been proposed. It's not the most recent one, but uh, to go on the Hungerford property right next to the little, still very small uh, Eatonville. And, um, when people got a sense of what was going to happen, they realized this was going to take over Eatonville. You know, a lot of people worried that this kind of development was just going to destroy the character of Eatonville and lead to gentr rapid gentrification. And ultimately, Eatonville would no longer be a predominantly black town. It would, it would go away. And so the question is, how do you fight something like this? The county owns the property. Eatonville says, but it's part of our heritage. We've been connected to it from the beginning. And so uh, last fall, a movement sort of began to save the school. Um, and this is people power at work. Um, and a lot of this was about invoking the spirit of 1887, the founding of the town. And you'll see that number come up a lot. And I'm going to give a lot of credit to this man, John Beecham, who is my walking tour partner. He had been saying, we have to, prevent, we have to do something. Hungerford's going to get sold. It's going to destroy Eatonville. Um, and so he came up with the idea of something called Land Back. He had heard about this indigenous groups uh, at Stanford University uh, talking about giving the land back, right? And he, that phrase really captured him. He said, we need to get our land back. And he started marketing that and putting the signs up. And suddenly the media started paying attention. You start to see a bunch of stories WESH 2, Eatonville Native launches land back campaign. That's a small start, but it really started to, steam, to, to snowball. Um, here's our walking tour. So John created a website, land back. Um, he was joined by another younger resident of Eatonville, Julian Johnson, created 1887 first. John had Eatonville1887.com. They both linked to a petition. Uh, younger, the younger Julian Johnson, who uh, is about 29 years old, he was using social media very effectively and, and um, T-shirts. And, and really, they were they're getting, starting to get attention. And the people in town, they were really mobilizing the people of Eatonville to put pressure on the city council to not approve a change in the comprehensive plan that the developers wanted. Because if they could stop that, the developers might pull out. The developers wanted certain... Um, changes that would ma allow them to do more residential units, less retail. That's technical, but in a sense, Eatonville still had some control here. So this is a moment in, in democracy in a historically black town, and it was, and also another par party stepped in. The Southern Poverty Law Center agreed to sort of advocate on behalf of Eatonville. They began to do research, they published articles, and uh, became a legal advisor. The press locally, uh, this is a really important article in the Sentinel. Uh, Desiree Stennett wrote a, 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 a piece that really explained in great detail what I only described very briefly about the 1950s exchange of property. Just to say that the press, which really had no interest in Hungerford for years when it was being sold, suddenly got very interested. And uh, that earlier article I showed you from the Sentinel wasn't even available on the website. It was only in the paper. Um, now everything is out there. And it's not just local press, it's uh, CBS Sunday Morning. Did anyone see the CBS Sunday Morning feature? Imagine Eatonville getting a, a five-minute segment on CBS Sunday Morning. That was huge. Uh, and then, of course, the fact that it was in, on CBS Sunday Morning made the local <laughs> newspaper. Um, so 
But I want to say the most important thing. So the press helped to raise consciousness beyond Eatonville, but really it was up to the people of Eatonville to change the council's position. The council had been three to two in favor of change to the comprehensive plan. The people rallied and flipped the vote to four to one against. That was people power. And, it, and the reason I stop on this one is because those councilors are there because Eatonville was a historically black township. They're all African American. They are uh, understand the meaning of this historically and culturally. If they had not been a town, if they had been a subdivision like Hannibal Square within Winter Park, they would not have that political power. At this very moment, that political power meant a lot, that they still had control over their destiny as a town. So what happened next? The developer said, we're not going to go forward with this. And that might have been for all kinds of reasons. They did not get the changes in the comprehensive plan that they wanted. They don't have to explain why. They may not have liked the publicity because uh, this was getting, getting very uncomfortable. But for whatever reason, they said, we're not going to go through with it, which means it's all back on the school board. So what's next? This is just from the other day, an op-ed piece by Karen Castro-Dentel, who represents Eatonville, saying, well, we can't give you the property, but let's sit down and talk. So here we are. It's sort of in a moment of possibility. Now we might actually have a conversation that has not really taken place until now. What is Eatonville's future? The people of Eatonville are going to try to figure that out and work something out with the, with the county. Thank you very much. All right, so I've got time for questions here. Yes? Thank you. I recall, I recall 35 years ago uh, when the Gold Mining Project yes. came up and I was part of an original task force and mm -hmm. PDC forming back then and it was a call out for the people. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Well, thank you so much, and, and, and I have to say a lot of the Hungerford story I had not delved into until about a, a year ago, before all of this, but, but not that long ago, because I always thought of Hungerford as kind of a postscript, or I never realized how central it was to Eatonville, and I had been focusing on that founding era, and, um, and, at, and when this really started to blow up, I said, I need to learn everything I can about the Hungerford School and its history, and we're still doing that research, I'm working on an op-ed for the Sentinel because I think there's more story to be told. And just for the audience out there, the question was about the road widening back in the late 80s. Uh, late 80s. Yeah, and which uh, threatened to, uh, it was taking a, a small road through Eatonville and making it a five lane cut through and the people rallied and it was Eatonville and Maitland residents rallied against it, and they won. And it led to the creation of Preserve Eatonville Community, which has, is the um, organization that created the Zora Festival, the annual Zora Festival, which was used to help publicize Eatonville and get people to s understand why Eatonville mattered. Now, Zora Neale Hurston, of course, catches people's attention, but it was also about Eatonville and making people understand that there was something to be saved. And now here we are again with an existential threat. I would think that's how it was viewed by many people. And I'm glad you raised Preserve Eatonville community and NY Nathiri and all the folks who have been involved with that because they, I mentioned sort of the people who were 
helping to raise awareness outside, but inside, structurally, it was PEC that has always been the most fierce defender of Eatonville, and PEC that hired, that is the client of Southern Poverty Law Center. It was PEC that sued the school board uh, with their lawyer, SPLC, but basically PEC is really the, the entity that is uh, representing the interests of those who want to preserve Eatonville and its historic character. Did I, did I, I'm sorry, I, I, I was told that I had to repeat some of it for the audience if they couldn't hear it. Well, I'm very simple, like, um, and I'm from Hopkins, mm -hmm. and back in the day, you know, Hopkins there was no Eatonville Center. Mm -hmm. And so the Right. Yeah, Hungerford, uh, yes, Robert Hungerford Normal and Industrial School. It has different names at different times. But we actually, thank you for pointing that out, that uh, this was the high school for the region, for many people in the region who could afford to send their students there. If they weren't from Winter Park, you could go because they had reached a contract. But a lot of students were sent by their families uh, from throughout this region. And um, Clyde Hall, who was an alum from, in his memoirs, listed where every student came from in the year 1941-42, and we plotted that and saw this great diversity of, you know, the map of its reach, Apopka being one of those communities that was served. And I think we want to publicize that and say a lot of people have a stake in this school, but right now Eatonville most of all, because it's... It's about preserving Eatonville, and so we're really emphasizing that connection between Eatonville and Hungerford, but not losing sight of the fact that this was a regional high school. And this is why it's hard to summarize. I almost need to do a Hungerford lecture onto itself, but in the 1930s, there was a kind of scandal that the principal, that the, that the board had uh, owed money to a principal and mortgaged the property. And uh, uh, then they realized we made a big mistake and um, decided that they shouldn't go through with it because he could basically have, you know, that could have been the end of the Hungerford School. So the courts were called into question and they ruled against the principal and said, but we're going to create a new board. It's going to be appointed by me, the chancellor, uh, Frank Wright, and it turns out from research that they are all, um, they're all white. And, that they, and that's not to say that they could not have the best interest. And in fact, they worked very hard to raise money for the school during the 40s. So I'm sure they were very much devoted to the school. But in the end, they started negotiating with the uh, county Negro superintendent of Negro education from 1947. This is three years before the transfer. They had already been working on a transfer. And when word got out that this was going to happen, they, um, they, they, they heard that Bethune-Cookman was interested and that maybe there would be a, a possibility of saving the school from the transfer. And they were willing to listen, but according to, you know, it sounds like from the lawsuit and the friends of the school, they were, didn't give a fair hearing to the people who wanted to save the school, that it was a done deal, that they had already kind of worked it out with the county. Um, they did, and those trustees were appointed by the superintendent and directed um, by, by the chancellor, by the circuit court judge, and answered to him. And when he directed them to negotiate with the school board, they did. So I, I don't think they had full autonomy. I don't think they necessarily represented the community interests. Um, that isn't to say it was stolen, but the, the value. Let me say this. That board raised $100-something, $50,000 to build new buildings during the 40s. The property sold for 16000 so the question might be, did they get a fair value? Did they, did they steal it? No, but they got a, an incredible bargain, and they undervalued that property, and they were supposed to keep it for Negro, the purposes of Negro education, and those codicils got removed over time, and they were supposed to reserve the chapel, and that got removed. So there were a lot of ways in which the county was able to profit from uh, this this acquisition, and it served, and it was also seen as kind of they were the angels stepping in to save Hungerford, but as I noted, they were under pressure to acquire property to build a public high school, and it really served their interests. I don't think they were angels. I'm not going to say they stole it, but I think they were in a position to negotiate a very favorable acquisition, and that they took steps to eliminate the restrictions on the property that enabled them to sell it for a lot of money years later. That's how I would put it for now. The 14 million? Wait, the 14. Oh, the, that, I can't figure that out because 
I, I, I'm, that's a great question. Where did the 14,000, the 16,000 that they paid for the property go? I think it might have gone to the trustees. There's something called the, the, there's a trust that was created, the Chapel Trust, and they give scholarships. And I think the money went into a scholarship fund. And so that's the best I can do. I'm still working through this. And so anything I say on this is speculative. I'm still trying to learn myself and understand it and not make mistakes. But my, that is my reading of it as, as of this moment. All right. Yeah. Oh, can we take one more? Are we over? Is it, uh, okay. I just wanted to know where the best place to follow along with what you learned and work. Well, I'm working on a, an article that kind of summarizes the research from this semester. So I've been working um, with my students to build. I teach a course called Digital Tools for Historians and gave the students the task of uh, finding stories that they wanted to tell visually. And but I have been also reading everything. I've read everything and have come up with a series of what I would consider to be historically based insights into the history that ties Eatonville very closely to Hungerford School, um, despite the fact that it doesn't own it. And I'm trying to document that in about five points. And I hope to get that published in the Sentinel. I haven't reached out to them and I haven't finished writing it. But I'll give you my card and then eventually we'll have a website. We do want to create a memory scape, a Hungerford memory scape, a, a kind of resource bank, because all the information is so scattered. I've been to Winter Park Public Library, Rollins Library, Hannibal Square, um, uh, where else? Uh, every local archive, including this one, Orange County Regional History, and trying to find every primary source I can find and, and put it in a place where we can access it. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, well, I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Dr. French. This was fantastic. Very uh, interesting, fascinating local history, so we really appreciate it. Bye.